son of Pakistan returns home, I always make it a point to inform Masuma in advance of my date of arrival. And she promptly um, no, I won't say she invites me, but she, she wants to be. I'm especially delighted today to find my old colleague Zubeda Mustafa sitting in, in the front row. She and I, along with Khalda Qureshi, used to occupy those cabins over there. We were the three research officers of the institute when the late Paja Sarvarasan Masuma's uh, eminent father presided over this institute. This, this place has the distinction of being the premier think tank of Pakistan. Many have, have come up subsequently, but Pakistan Institute of International Affairs continues to occupy prime position amongst all those think tanks. And what a delight it is that we have a, a lady presiding over this think tank. She, with all her experience, with that scholarship has brought great repute to the Institute. And I consider it a matter of pride for myself that I can count myself amongst her friends. Thank you, Masuma, for providing me this platform. The end game in the Middle East I don't know why I picked up this, this topic. Or Masuma picked it up for me. But before I dilate on the end game, this enlightened uh, crowd should challenge my intelligence and ask me, what is the game about? What was the game about? And when precisely did it start? Because we can, we can only talk about the end of the game only after knowing what the game is, what the game was from the game. I recall I happened to be in Delhi in February of 1912, seven years ago. And this was the period when the Syrian civil war uh, had not completed its, its first year. They invited me to, uh, to two lectures at the famous Jamaya Vidya, which has its own distinction because it was founded by those who led the Khilafat movement in the 1920s. And one lecture was on the Middle East on the Arab Spring. And I remember uh, after I had delivered a, an hour-long lecture, one student got up and said, Sir, can you predict when the Syrian civil war is going to be over? And I said, my, my dear young man, if I happen to visit daily again, five years hence, the Syrian improbio would still be on our hands. That was seven years ago. But as I said before, we, we, we try to trace what the contours of the end game are. We must go back to the genesis of the game. When did it exactly start? When did the game begin? And for that, I'll have to take you back exactly a century ago. 
It was 1908 when oil was discovered in the Middle East for the first time. This was at a place called Masjid Sulaiman in Iran. Five years later, oil was discovered in Iraq near Kirkuk. A year later, oil was found in Bahrain. And Saudi Arabia was the last country tapped by the oil explorers. So this discovery of oil preceded World War I. And it also coincided with Western infatuation with Israel. I don't have to remind you about the Balfour Declaration, which was announced on, was it November 1st, 1917? 1917. But the spade work for a Jewish homeland had started in the last decade of the 19th century. That is when Zionist International was founded in, in Switzerland. And they started looking around for friends and helpers to transform their dream into a reality. These two, these two developments, the discovery of oil in the Gulf, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, and the beginning of the movement to create Israel started simultaneously, almost simultaneously. And for the last one century, for the last 100 years, this has been the prime goal of the Western world. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-edged weapon which has been used against the Arab world. One is to make sure that oil would continue to be supplied to the Western economies, and two, that the Jewish homeland, which took the name of the State of Israel in 1948, 40 years after the discovery of oil, would not, would not be threatened. That being the case, now I'll, I'll bring you forth to where it all started in the modern age. For that, we'll have to go back to 1973, when OPEC imposed its first oil embargo against the West. And the architect of that oil embargo was King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. That embargo gave birth to what is known as the Kissingerian Doctrine. Kissinger, Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State in 1973 when the oil embargo was imposed and his words are still on record. He said, we cannot allow this blackmail of our economies to go unchallenged. If it is allowed to go unchallenged, this will choke our economies. Therefore, and these are the lines, these are the words which should be underlined. Therefore, if necessary, we should be prepared to land our troops on the oil-producing fields of Arabia. Why did Kissinger feel the need to say it so categorically, so clearly, so bluntly, I would say, so undiplomatically? Because the plan that started in the early century, in the early 20th century, was to make sure 
that neither the oil supply lines were threatened nor was there any threat posed to Israel. Therefore, it was necessary to create conditions for it. And I don't have to remind you that colonialism starting from the 17th century and right up to the 20th century relied upon creating local surrogates. In the colonies, they, they, they created local surrogates. In the global expansion of, it, of that idea, it was found essential to create regional surrogates. The United States, after the end of World War II, had created regional surrogates in the Arab world as well as on the Persian side of the Gulf. The Shah of Iran was supposed to be the main policeman of Western interests in that part of the world. And then on the other side of the Gulf, there was Saudi Arabia, which, with which the United States had entered into a compact right in the closing days of World War II. Many of you may be familiar about that meeting which took place on board an American destroyer. It was USS Quincy, I suppose, where President Roosevelt, and he was dying, he was a dying man, FDR was a dying man in those days. He invited King Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia to USS Quincy and there the two of them entered into a compact. You and Shaw, that oil supply lines will not be threatened and we'll make sure that Ali Saud would continue to rule over the Arabian Peninsula. That was the compact. So there was Saudi Arabia, which was supposed to be in charge of Western interests. But lo and behold, in 1973, the oil embargo was imposed at the behest of King of Saudi Arabia. The entire jigsaw puzzle that had been laid so carefully, so meticulously, was threatened by that move of in Faisal. So, Kissinger, no, 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 not surprisingly, found it necessary to make sure that what had been conceived in the first half of the 20th century would continue to prevail in the better half of the 20th century. He hit upon a formula which, as I said, has since been known as the Kissinger Doctrine. And, that, and the doctrine was that we must pick them up. Them means those who are against American interests, against Western interests. They must be picked up one by one. <coughs> the first target was, unsurprisingly, the most powerful country amongst the Arabs, which was Egypt. And there, Anwar Sadat came in handy. He was persuaded to enter into a peace deal with Israel. So the most powerful Arab country was cleverly neutralized. That left two other countries which could pose a threat to Israel. One was Iraq, the other was Syria. It was to the fortune of the Western world that both Iraq and Syria were ruled by dictators. Both of them sold allegiance to the Baathist philosophy of secularism, but both were sown enemies of each other. Saddam Hussein was cultivated and he became, in the words 
of many American writers and commentators, a Western man. But then something occurred which, which Kissinger had not visualized at all when he became the author of his doctrine. And that was that in 1979, the Iranian Islamic Revolution took place. It had never been conceived by the, by the planners sitting in, the, in their drawing, how, uh, drawing uh, at their drawing boards that the Shah of Iran, who was supposed to be the principal policeman of Western interest, would be overthrown. And overthrown by, of all the people, the clergy, the Buddhas, who were despised by, by Western planners and architects. Cutting a long story short, Saddam Hussein was persuaded to invade Iran. He was told that the Iranians were busy in their revolution, therefore it would be a virtual walk over for him. But then he got entangled in Iran for long eight years, eight long years. But in the meantime, the, the Americans continued to pick up their friends, to choose their friends in the Arab world. Egypt had been neutralized. The sheikhs of the Gulf were always friendly because, because they did not have their their roots amongst their, their people. So that side of the Arab world was not, not threatening at all. Syria and Iraq could be, could be troublesome. Iraq was got involved first in the Iran-Iraq war and then after, once that war was over, three years later he was persuaded, Saddam was persuaded to demand his money back from the Kuwaitis. Kuwaitis refused, the end result was occupation of, of Kuwait by, by, by Saddam Hussein. And then the Americans came to the rescue of Kuwait and what Kissinger had talked of uh, seven years ago, 17 years ago, happened in 1990 when American troops landed in Saudi Arabia. What happened afterwards, you are all familiar with that. The Gulf War I took place. Saddam was defeated. He was expelled from Iraq. He was, he was forced to go back, retreat into Iraq. But then, but then, restrictions were imposed on Saddam. Iraq was debarred from using its air force over its own territory. No Iraqi aircraft could fly over its own land. And then another kind of engineering started. That engineering was that Kurdish areas were virtually detached from Baghdad. Saddam's, Saddam's rule, Saddam's remit did not function over, over, over the British lands. I remember I was ambassador in Iraq during the days when, when Iraq was under worst sanctions in the history of mankind. So much so that the Iraqi government could not even import lead pencils for its school children because UN, U, US experts had decided that lead, uh, that uh, carbon from the, these lead pencils could be used for military purposes. That was the kind, that was the, 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 the extent of sanctions that Iraq suffered from. You may all be familiar about the horrendous price that Iraq was made to, to pay under those sanctions. Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State when she was asked if half a million children, 
Iraqi children killed because of these, those sanctions was a price worth paying. And she, without batting an eyelid, said yes, that was a price worth paying. That was the extent of the sanctions. So Iraq, Iraq was also practically neutralized. While on the other hand, Kurdish forces were being trained by Israeli military experts. Arms were being supplied to the Kurds by the Israelis. The idea was to keep Iraq in ferment. And then, in 1993, George W. Bush found it convenient to invade Iraq on our line, supposedly because Iraq was in control, in possession of weapons of mass destruction, those weapons which were never found in Iraq. So for all practical purposes, Iraq has been truncated. They could not create an independent Kurdistan because Turkey would not allow it. Turkey, from the days of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, has drawn a red line in the sand. And that red line is that come what may, there will not be an independent state of Kurdistan, period. No Turkish leader can afford to allow the Kurds who constitute only 15% of the, of the Turkish population to become independent. That left only one country in the Arab world which, which could still be inconvenient for Israel, and that was Syria. The Syrian crisis started, as you are all familiar, in the footsteps of the Arab Spring. That short-lived Arab Spring could not flourish in, in Syria, Syria too. But then it triggered a series of, of crises. It provided, in addition, opportunities to those who had a bone to pick with Syria for one reason or another. Let us analyze the characters involved in the Syrian crisis. Number one, the Syrian people who rose against the autocratic regime of Bashar al-Assad in February in, in May 2011, and they were they were inspired by the success at that time. At that success was shortly, but at that time the Arab Spring was in its early spring. So those people in Syria who, who wanted uh, their freedoms back, they were inspired by by the Arab Spring. They rose against the autocratic regime of Bashar al-Assad. Interestingly, uh, Syria is unique in the sense that it's one country which has been ruled by one family since 1970. It's going to be fully 50 years next year for this Assad family ruling over Syria. One faction was the Syrian people. The second faction was created by those who did not like Syria's alliance with Iran. And there the sectarian feeling came into play. Saudis and other sheikhs of the Gulf hated the idea of Syria being in alliance with, with Iran. First of all, there was a, a, an odd 
situation in Syria that 80% of its Muslims happened to be Sunni, but it was ruled over by a minority, the Alawites, which, which are a, an offshoot of uh, the Shia branch of Islam. So the Wahhabis of the Gulf, led by Saudi Arabia, saw in the beginning of the Syrian crisis an opportunity to see the back of the ruling Assad family in Syria. They supplied arms and created their own, their own religious brigades to rise against the Syrian regime. And then the non-religious, secular factions among the Sunnis got together and created their own force. They became known as the Syrian uh, defense, the defense forces of Syrian people against Saddam, uh, against uh, Bashar al-Assad. And the fourth faction saw an opportunity for itself and got into the fray and that happened to be the ISIS or ISIL. They had the support of, of other, another uh, fanatical faction called uh, uh, Al-Nusra Front. These four started fighting amongst themselves and that has been the pattern ever since. But then, the Russians and the Iranians got the better, got the upper hand in, in, in the fighting. The result today is that, except for that small uh, area around Idlib, which is closer to, to the Turkish border, much of the country has been wrested back by the regime, by Assad regime from the rebels. So it's only a truncated part of Syria which is still under the control of the rebels. The Americans wanted to have their own game, to, have, to, 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 to realize their own interests in this fighting. And that was that they started supporting the Kurds amongst the Syrians to rise against Bashar al-Assad. But then, the activation of the Kurds against the regime invited the Turkish backlash. Tayyip Erdogan had been one of the firm supporters of uh, Bashar al-Assad in the initial stages of the Syrian crisis because he saw in him a progressive leader. But then, when the Americans started supporting the, the, the Kurds, that was going against the grain of the, of the Turks. So they let it be known to, to their NATO allies that their effort to, to prop up uh, the Kurds against uh, against Bashar al-Assad and to help the Kurds realize their age-old dream of their own independent state would go against the interest of Turkey. So there we are at this current stage where nobody can predict which way the wind is going to blow in Syria. That was the situation when I delivered my lecture seven years ago, uh, Jama and Milia. None could predict which way the wind would, would blow in Syria. Nor can one say where and how it is going to end subsequently. What looks like is, and this is perhaps what Donald Trump can foresee, that the outcome is not going to be to the liking of the Americans. They wanted to get rid of uh, the Assad regime. That is not going to happen. 
That is not going to happen because the Syrians at large do not want to see that kind of an outcome of, of this crisis. Another actor in the, in the game is Israel. Israel, which has been in possession of Golan Heights since 1967. And that gives it not only a commanding a strategic position against the Syrian regime, but also um, it has been exploiting uh, the mineral resources in Golan Heights, principally oil. Israel incidentally did not want to see Bashar al-Assad go because the Syrian regime never, never posed a threat to Israel. So the Americans were also happy letting the Assad family rule over, over Syria because it was, it did not pose any, any threat to their principal ally in the, in, in the Middle East. So this is how the, uh, the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are presently scattered. We can see the Syrian crisis not ending anytime soon, but when it ends, it is not going to be in the interest or to the liking of the West. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the Americans have made sure that Israel is not in any way inconvenienced by this crisis. Because quietly behind the, behind the scene, the Trump administration has created a friendly regime in Saudi Arabia. The principal ally uh, in, 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 in that part of the world. You are all familiar with, with the uh, uh, friendship which has been quietly developing between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel. So much so that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu can proudly say to the world that um, Saudi Arabia and Israel share a lot of common interest, share a lot of ground amongst common interests. And therefore, Israel is quite happy with, it, with, that, with that development. So the end game is that there is no end game. There is no end game in sight. Because the Americans have come to the conclusion that they will be better off leaving the Middle East in its present situation. They are happy uh, with their allies who can always guarantee the supply of oil to them. And by the way, their dependence on, on oil from the Middle East has dwindled down to a level where even if supplies were completely dropped off, they will, they will, they will not be inconvenienced. They will not be un unhappy with that because one, they have their own uh, oil to fall back upon, and then oil from other sources uh, will will continually be available to them. Uh, Middle East has the largest oil deposits in the world. It is also uh, supplying 30% of uh, the global oil supplies. But then Western economies have been developing alternate technologies. I can, I can say that with, with certainty because where I live in Canada, um, the government is is uh, providing all sorts of subsidies uh, to the uh, development of, uh, of hybrid 
hybrid cars and uh, electric cars. So dependence on oil throughout the world is declining. And by the same stroke, dependence on oil from the Middle East is also declining. So that, that, is, that is something which the Arabs should be aware of, that their commanding position as far as the global oil market was concerned is on a slippery slope. Uh, and with that, their political clout is also going to go down. Whatever clout they could they could claim to have. So the end result is that we are in a position, we are at a juncture where the end game in the Middle East remains in the words of Winston Churchill. It's a problem wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. That is the long and short of the situation crisis that has been on our hands for such a long time. The bottom line is that the Arab world poses no threat to Israel. All those countries which could be problematic to it have been neutralized. Uh, the economic interests of the Western world are no longer threatened. This Indian doctrine has been very, very successful from its, uh, from its currency to date. Um, the Americans are happy. The Western world is heavy. The only country which is now facing an, uh, a, an uncertain situation is Turkey. Because Turkey doesn't, doesn't know what kind of a neighborhood it is going to inherit. By the way, you may have heard um, a lot about uh, uh, 2023 when many pundits are, have been predicting that Turkey is going to uh, enter a new phase because 2023 would see the end of the Treaty of Lausanne which, which was imposed on Turkey in 1923 and which gave birth to Turkey in its present form. How Tayyip Erdogan is going to to deal with that situation is something which, which is still ahead of us. Uh, I wouldn't uh, hazard to, to make a prediction of what Turkey is going to do, but then what is certain is that Turkey will not allow, will never allow the creation of an independent state of Kurdistan. You, you may empathize with the Kurds. I have all my sympathies with them. They are an unfortunate people. They have all the attributes, they have all the qualities, they have every right to have their own independent state, but then they are not going to have it anytime soon because Kurds are divided. The largest number of them live in Turkey. Uh, the, the second largest in, in, in Syria, the third largest in, in Iraq, and the fourth largest in, in Iran. None of these countries, none of these countries is, has ever been in favor of an independent Kurdistan. So here we can empathize with the Kurds. They are an unfortunate people. They are paying the price of being prisoners of their own geography. Look at the look at the irony in the situation. Here we have a people who are entitled to have their own sovereign land. Here we have a people who are who should be entitled to be free, to have their own independent state, but they can't have it. But on the other hand, uh, a state has been created for a people 
on a land which did not belong to them. And the state has been given to them by a people who were not supposed to have any kind of title on it. That, my friends, is one of the ironies of history that we must learn to live with. Thank you very much. I think I should stop here. But I am open to, to questions from you. Feel absolutely free to question me on the subject that I have dilated upon, but don't ask me about about Naya Pakistan. Thank you very much. Ambassador Karamazullah will take questions. I just want to make a request. Please be precise in the formulation of your question. Please don't make a speech yourself. Uh, Dr. Tanat Pizar. Like uh, Satan bin Natan, and there was one more name I'm forgetting that led something. So uh, even Abu Bakr Baghdadi is probably uh, a member of one of these intelligence agencies. So what role do you see for it? Uh, will it uh, be defeated and thrown out? Or uh, will it continue to bother the people of that area? Well, the old saying, the, the proof of pudding is in the eating. Whatever blood has been shed by ISIS or ISIL, and a lot of blood has been shed, has been shed in Muslim countries, and the blood shed was of Muslims. So that gives you a clue precisely to what you, you, you said at the beginning of your question. Why is it, this is a question which has been asked so often, why is it that ISIL or ISIS today has never targeted Israel or any Jewish interest anywhere in the world? That, that gives you a complete answer to the question that you raised. Now, about the defeat of ISIL. They have been defeated in, 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 uh, in Iraq. Mosul, uh, Mosul in particular, of course, so they, that, that was the area they occupied. They have been defeated in Iraq. They have been expelled from Iraq. But they have not yet been defeated in Syria. And if you have been following uh, uh, news bulletins lately, in five days today, they have attacked the American troops in Syria a uh, second time, killing five people today. So much as uh, uh, they may be hated, and they should be hated, because they, they have brought so much ignominy to, to, to Islam and Muslims. They are still a, a, a fairly active force uh, in, in Syria and as I, uh, as I said about the end game, nobody can predict whether they are going to be wiped out from, from Syria completely. Luckily, luckily, uh, uh, Turkey has been on its guard against ISIL for a long time and you have not to date heard of an ISIL operation inside Turkey. So uh, I personally bank on the vigilance of, of uh, uh, the Turks. They will, they will make sure that this uh, uh, fitna is the, that's the right word to be used again uh, about uh, ISIL. This fitna does not raise its head in uh, in Turkey, it will not. It will. It will never be allowed to raise its head in in uh, Iran, and that 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 is what uh, has been bothering the West. See? Uh, now the end game aims at crippling Iran for good, and they, they they have used all kinds of tactics against it. They uh, they are now again uh, very proudly. 
uh, saying this, that uh, the sanctions against Iran are biting. They are biting, they are stringent. They, they are one of the worst in, in the history of sanctions. The idea is to, to change the regime in Iran. And Bolton recently said that uh, he, he would be celebrating next Christmas uh, in Tehran, which reminded me of uh, what General Chaudhary boasted of uh, when, they, when, he, when the Indians invaded Pakistan in 1965. He, he had given the glad tidings to his officers that they would be drinking uh, Patiala Pak in Lahore Jim Khan. That, that never came to happen. So, John Bolton is not going to celebrate Christmas ever in Tehran. He, 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 he can forget about it. But now all the, the entire thrust of Western policies uh, is to have a regime change in Tehran. Ambassador Zafrullah. Well, his policy now of the joint forces from Syria and of Pakistan, and of course, as you have said, the pressure of Iran. How do you see the whole Middle East region coming up with the new situation? The, the, the realignment of the foreign policies, the role of Russians and Chinese have come into it. One school of thought is that Trump and uh, Putin have come to a compromise in which Trump was elected and in return Americans are doing this because Americans are quite concerned about the withdrawal of troops uh, from Syria and from this region. Number two, one factor which is against Iran by the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia, is about the Shia factor. And you may kindly recall that when Trump went for their GCC Council, I think the GCC Council was meeting last year or a year before last, when he visited Iran, he clearly said that Iran is a terrorist state. Now, my question is, sir, when world pressure is in Iran now, what would be the role of the other major superpowers? EU may be divided. On the sanctions, EU was divided because of this nuclear thing. Russians and Chinese have a wait and see policies, but now Americans have come forward with these at all. What effect do you see that would be on this region? Of course, in the end game, there is no end game. But specifically, what would be the status of Iran? That is the question, sir. Yeah. Um, the Arabs no longer pose any problem to the American interests. The only worry is uh, that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has become a little too active for American liking. Um, uh, the misadventure in Yemen is a source of worry to them. Uh, Congress has recently passed a re resolution um, against American uh, providing any sort of, uh, of uh, military cover uh, to the Saudis in Yemen. Uh, but, uh, and, and the Americans would also want uh, Saudi Arabia to patch up with, with Qatar. Uh, this this uh, Qatari uh, this, uh, situation is, is, is totally, totally uh, something uh, which makes no sense. No sense at all. Just as the eight-year-long war with Iran, Iran made no sense at all. Yes, the Americans would like to to create problems with, for Iran because Israel thinks it is not safe, totally safe, as long as the threat of Iran is not neutralized. They have no threat from, from Turkey. In fact, um, uh, although there has been a dilution of uh, friendly relations with, with uh, Erdogan, 
but uh, basically uh, the diplomatic relations remain intact. So there is no problem with, uh, from from Turkey. Iran is the only odd man out. That is the only only thorn in in the Israeli flesh, and they would like to remove it. But. Uh, they have tried all, all sorts uh, of uh, tactics which have not been successful. They, ca they, they, they cannot have a regime of their choice, of their liking in Tehran. So what can they do? The, the most they can do is what they, they are doing currently. That is, impose all, all sorts of uh, economic sanctions against Iran. Short of taking military action, although uh, for the sake of public consumption, every time you hear an American talking about Iran, he would end up by saying that the military option is very much on the table. It may remain on the table, but it's, it's, it's not going to be utilized. Why? Why it is not going to be utilized? Because the Americans know that invading Iran will not be a cup of tea as invading uh, Iraq was. There will be serious consequences. There will be serious repercussions. There will be a fallout which would go totally against the fundamental American interest in this part of the world. To bring bring about the regime change in Iran, I, this is my perception because I've been visiting Iran. I don't think it will be possible. And you are right. In case if it happens, there will be another third world war. Because this would be a repeat of that biblical situation where uh, Samson brought down the temple <laughs> uh, upon himself. That that will not happen. That is unlikely to happen. Also, Hezbollah remains. Hezbollah, role of Hezbollah. Look, Hezbollah, uh, the Syrian crisis. I, I should have mentioned this. The Syrian crisis had Hezbollah very much at its core because Israel hates Hezbollah. The Americans hate Hezbollah. Hezbollah is there largely because of Iran. So as long as Iran is there, Hezbollah will, will be a, a threat to Israel. That's why you will find Netanyahu saying in, in every time he gets on a rostrum that uh, there is a terrorist regime in, in Tehran which is against, uh, which wants to wipe us off the map of the world. The principal enmity is against Iran. That is the bottom line. Regime change. Regime change. No, I don't foresee. I don't foresee any regime change in Iran. No, none at all. Shakir Shaza, as a teacher in a local college, is still town. Honorable respected speaker, you just did a comprehensive analysis and making a squash the situation of uh, the Middle East. Thank you very much. Sir, my question is, uh, what is going on in this? Uh, as a layman, any of what is said, Jamal Fushus is murder in Turkey, and sometimes Saudi Arabia is to be destabilized there. Some is to be disputed between, created between, Qatar and Al Jazeera Brown, what is that? You have learned. So my question is precisely that the what is the role of Syria or, or, or Russia in Syria and Middle East? What are you looking to the future? And the Russians have invested a lot in Syria. Ah, okay. They they have a, a a military base in Syria. Uh, the Assad regime has been friendly to the Russians, not from today, but from a long time ago. So the Russians were, wanted to, to protect their own interests. And that's why they became actively involved. They have been successful. 
the Americans have not. That's it. That is the, the, the end of the story. The, the problem with the Americans is that they can never think through any, any situation. They try one option after another, but unless a situation has been completely thought through uh, before taking action, this is what happens. You know, you you take at random actions. You 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 uh, prevaricate. Uh, you stumble from one option to another. The end result is what what you can see. Uh, first, about Ojala, Abdullah Ojala. It's Ojala, not Ojala. Abdullah Ojala. Well, uh, incidentally, he was he was arrested. You know where? He was arrested in Saudi Arabia. So, and then transported to 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 uh, Turkey. He's a prisoner. Uh, the Turkish government has been holding on to him as a bargaining chip. But then, as I said, they are not going to bargain over an independent Kurdish state. That is out. Yes, there is a grudge that the Turks have been nursing about uh, the Treaty of Lausanne. Because that treaty forced them to cede Mosul to Iraq. Iraq was, was an artificial creation. You know about uh, about how the the present Iraqi state came into into being. They they put together the three vilayats of uh, the Ottoman Empire: uh, the vilayat of Mosul, vilayat of Baghdad. Vilayat the Basra and hammered out the state of Iraq, over which they imported a prince from Arabia, who became King Faisal, Faisal of Iraq. He was he was a son of uh, Sharif Hussain of Makkah, who had been persuaded to rise in revolt against the Ottomans. It's a long story, long history, but uh, Turks are very sore about about Mosul because Mosul is where the oil is. So Mosul was wrested from the Turks, from the Turks and given uh, to, to, the, to the Iraqis. And then one of the conditions in the Treaty of Lausanne, there were two conditions which are still biting Turkey. One, that Turkey will not explore for oil. Two, that Turkey will have no control over the Straits of Bosphorus. Imagine a great source of revenue for Egypt is what it earns from the Suez Canal. But Turkey does not make a penny from all those ships passing through the Straits of Bosphorus entering from the Black Sea or entering from the Mediterranean and going to the Black Sea or entering from Black Sea going to the Mediterranean. They will become entitled to, to demand a fee from all those ships passing through, the, through that passage after the lapse of the Treaty of Lausanne. And the D-Day for them will be 2023. What Tayyip Erdogan does after that is still uh, an imponderable. There's a question mark. Will, will he start digging for oil? But they should. Every, every country is entitled to, to dig for oil. And uh, uh, I know about the Turkish plans to, to uh, dig a canal that would link the uh, Sea of Marmara with Black Sea. That would shorten the passage considerably. And Pakistan, oh yes. What is Pakistan's interest in the Arab world? Well, that is known to all in sundry. We have millions of our people gainfully employed in, in, in the Gulf countries. They, they are amongst the 
largest uh, uh, remittance centers of foreign exchange uh, to the country. That is one interest. The second interest is we cannot allow uh, Gulf countries to be taken over by the Indians. We have already seen uh, a large influx of Indian workers in, in Saudi Arabia, so much so that now I think there are more Indian workers in Saudi Arabia than, than, than Pakistanis. Uh, similar is the case in other countries. Of course, the Indians are entitled to have more of their people uh, working because they have five times our uh, population. So, so uh, that numerical strength and that gives them the title to, to have more of their workers. But then, we, we are talking of political influence. Uh, we have a stake in making sure that those countries uh, in the Arab part of the Gulf remain friendly to us. In fact, the problem uh, for us is equally vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Because uh, Iran over the years, uh, one, because of our policies, and two, because of the proactive policies of India, has become a little too friendly to, towards Delhi, which we have to watch out for. Um, and then I personally believe that uh, this end game in the Arab world is going to test all three principal non-Arab countries of the region, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. Here we have an opportunity. Uh, you remember uh, we, we had this uh, uh, Baghdad Pact in which all of us were, 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 were members. And then we had this RCD, which is still there which is still there under a different nomenclature, under a different name. Then we, now the, the uh, recent developments uh, demand that we should have some sort of an understanding. I, I, I would be shy to call it a military alliance, but we must have some sort of a military understanding these three countries, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, to create a bulwark against a possible implosion in the Arab world, which, which, which is distant. But I can foresee the day will come. A day will come when the Arab masses, which have been denied their fundamental rights for such a long time. And I say it repeatedly. Every time I address uh, from this forum, I think I have said it, that we Pakistanis should consider ourselves lucky. We have a lot of deficiencies. There are a lot of weaknesses we suffer from. But then we have one blessing. And that blessing is the freedom of speech. The freedom of, to write whatever we want to. The freedom to say whatever we, we wish to. These are freedoms which you cannot show me anywhere, starting from uh, the end of the Arab world in Morocco down to the Gulf. These freedoms are conspicuous by their absence in the Arab world. And I, I have been arguing it with my Arab friends who, who, are, who, who get very emotional on this issue. When I say that a day is going to come, you know, their argument, their argument is that our governments have provided all worldly comforts to our people, so they are not going to ever demand what we say is their fundamental right. But my argument is that, despite all these worldly comforts, the 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 belly may be can tinted, but then the mind starts working, and that mind starts questioning. And uh, a, a, a fundamental question that comes to mind is, 
why do why are we deprived of those freedoms which are taken for granted elsewhere in the world? Thank you very much, Mr. Prasad. Thank you, Karamat, for the very good lecture you've given us. And this last issue which you brought up, I think you should ask me, who's from the media and who lives in Pakistan, that the freedom of press or freedom which you talk about. But that just came up. It's not one of my original questions. I don't agree with you there, first of all. I mean, it's a question of degree. Uh, maybe the Arabs and the other Middle East countries are worse off. But my question is, first of all, there's another end game going on in Afghanistan. In fact, that they termed it such in the RAND report, which was published recently. So what is the relationship between the two? And secondly, uh, do you agree with Pakistan's policy towards this end game, although you explained what I am saying? But, and there's so much division in the Arab world. And once we start taking sides, how do you explain it? How will it benefit us? And then when we start taking so much of uh, loan or whatever you call it, because we have to, we need it. So we are going to be, in a way, beholden to them. So how are we going to get out of all this mess? Uh, as far as the Nea Pakistan goes. Mm. Mm. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me take up the last part of your question. The, the so-called Arab loans. Are they really loans? Or are they giving us a bribe? <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, uh, I often remind people uh, of this very delicate, uh, uh, delicate art of balancing our feet between the Arabs and the non-Arabs. And when I talk of non-Arabs, I refer only to one country, and that is Iran. Now, let me take you back to the Iran Iraq war. <coughs> when General Zawul Haq was in command, Ziaul Haq is a reviled man in the eyes of our intelligentsia. I don't agree with that, <laughs> with that assessment, but that is the general perception about General Ziaul Haq that he is the author of what we are reaping today in agreement on that. Then came a situation during that war when Saudi Arabia asked Ziaul Haq to allow those two brigades of our army which had been stationed on the Saudi soil Askari Maidan Me Shikas De Dek Usma Kamiyab De Dek Ab De Dek is sirf ek siyasi tasfiyah raha jata hai Siyasi tasfiyah kya hooga? Mai ne samajhta hoon ke siyasi tasfiyah is ke siwa or kuch nahi hooga ke सीरिया के लिए एक नया आइन बनाया जाए और बशर असद की के के जो की जो कुबत है उसको थोड़ा बहुत कम कर दिया जाए चाहे वो कागज पे कम किया जाए लेकिन कम करना बहुत जरूरी है इसके अलावा मेरी मेरी दानिश में सीरिया का कोई और हल नहीं है बशर असद को हटाने में नाकाम हो चुके हैं जो भी उसके महालफीन थे और जैसा कि मैंने कहा कि सीरिया की अक्सरियत ये चाहती है कि जो निज़ाम है वो चलता रहे वरना अगर उस निज़ाम को बदला गया तो फिर सीरिया का अहवाल भी वही होगा जो इराक में हुआ है जो लीबिया में हुआ है लीबिया बल्कि ज़्यादा बेहतर मिसाल लीबिया में जो हो रहा है वही सीरिया में जो to allow those brigades to be deployed on behalf of Iraq against Iran. And that revived man said, nothing doing. Our forces are not mercenaries. We are not going to take sides between two brotherly states. And I can I can I can tell you from my own experience because in those eight eight, eight years there were a number of Islamic conferences, I participated in some of them, where we 
used to spend hours drafting the final communique where the Iranians and the Iraqis would disagree over where to stop, to put a full stop, where to put a semicolon, where to stop, uh, put, uh, put a, a, a comma. We, we were the, uh, the peacemakers. And that kind of, in that kind of situation, it was a, a great test of our resilience. Our brothers in Saudi Arabia were asking us to take sides of, of, of one country against the other. We said, no, we will not do it. They said, if you, do, if we, you don't want to uh, send your troops for the aid of Iraq, we'll send them back. Oh, fine, send them back. They, they, they were sent back. We lost a lot of money in that, in that process. But then, that is an example worth keeping in mind. That is an example which we should be following today. We are not. We've been following it now. Uh, uh, yes, a question mark has, has, has dropped up on that since uh, General Rahib Sharif went to lead that alliance which is only so far on paper. He, 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 is, he is commanding an army which is not there. But then, we know it. We know it that the Saudis have uh, uh, come up with that, with that idea which, is, which are hopefully would never materialize to be used against Iran. Their whole misadventure in, in Yemen again is targeted against Iran. So yes, it's going to test our caliber, it is going to test our diplomacy, it is going to test our skills, but we, we must balance our feet. The Americans, as usual, do not know how to get out of Afghanistan. They are in the typical situation of a man who is riding a tiger and is scared of getting off its, uh, its back because uh, the tiger may eat it. So, um, but then we cannot uh, forsake Afghanistan. It is, it is our backyard. Well, much as some people may disagree with it, uh, it is our backyard. We, we, we have to have a secure Afghanistan in order to make sure that our back is not exposed. I am now going to wind up this session, but before I do so, I have promised to you that, that, that I will... This young I, man who wants... Uh, no, I am winding up this session. I have promised Ayub that I will give him one question on one condition Ayub. And that is that you will ask the question in Urdu. Syrian <laughs> law <laughs> political settlement, proper settlement, there are a lot of. I am not going to do it. Now, the CIC is a CIC. 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 The सीरिया के लिए एक नया आईन बनाया जाए और बशर असद की के के जो की जो उपलब्ध है उसको थोड़ा बहुत कम कर दिया जाए चाहे वो कागज पे कम किया जाए लेकिन कम करना बहुत जरूरी है इसके अलावा मेरी मेरी दानिश में सीरिया का कोई और हल नहीं है बशर असद को हटाने में नाकाम हो चुके हैं जो भी उसके बाहर टीम थे और जैसे कि मैंने कहा कि सीरिया की अक्सरियत ये चाहती है कि जो निज़ाम है वो चलता रहे वरना अगर उस निज़ाम को बदला गया तो फिर सीरिया का अहवाल भी वही होगा जो इराक में हुआ हैजरनली और एक्सटर्नली फाइव मिलियन पीपल है so, what will happen? Now that they have devastated Syria among themselves, 
Is the West now going to come with its contractors to build it up? Yeah. Of course. Exactly. Of course. That is the game. That is the game. Yeah. It's a win-win situation yes. for them. Now, the rebuilding of yeah. Syria, when it starts, if it starts, well, when it starts, it will be the Western contractors yes. who will come in with all sorts of uh, rosy reconstruction and redevelopment plans and they will be the ones who will eat all the uh, fat of the lamb. Why not Russians? Sorry, sorry, Balai, Why not Russians or Chinese? Russians and Chinese, uh, Chinese will, will be a better substitution, but, but it all depends on uh, who is providing the finance. If the Chinese are prepared to invest, yes, I think uh, they would be well. Russians do not have the, the capacity. They, they have uh, all sorts of problems of their own. Uh, they have a lot of reconstruction to do at home. I know there are um, some young people who still want to ask questions, but we are going to uh, wind up and uh, you can meet uh, the ambassador over tea. We'll stay for a cup of tea, Karana. Yes, of course. So I'm sure there are many people, even some of from the media, who would want to interview you. So please make use of this presence over there. Uh, uh, the back. So, I want to thank you very much, Karana, for for never forgetting in your annual visit to come to this institute. And I look forward to many, many, many years. Whether we are here or not, you will surely be there. And you are going to come here and speak every year. Thank and you I want to give you this copy of the latest issue of the Horizon, for which you wrote as a young person and for which, thank you, you continue to write today. Thank, thank you. you.